and welcome to another edition of For the Birds with Richard Cole. Hi, Richard. How are you? Hi there. Hello, everybody. It is great to see you. This is a very exciting time of year when having to do with birds. I'm all out of seed. I've got to go pick up some more and can't wait to get it out there because there's a lot happening right now. So tell us a little bit about the things you're going to talk about today, Richard. Well, it is an exciting time and it's a, it's a time of change for birds. Uh, migration's underway. Uh, it's been underway for a while. We're uh, the birds that went south in winter are coming back, and the birds that moved into the south for the winter are moving back to the north. And uh, we're seeing a lot of that transition. And it's it's nesting season for all the songbirds, uh, the smaller songbirds especially. Uh, it's time for them. They've already been staking out territory. Your territorial calls. You'll see them get a little aggressive with each other. Uh, and uh, you'll see some drop off at your feeders as we move into this just for a few weeks as uh, say your local titmouse gets very territorial if he has a nest very close by to your feeders it's going to tip, keep all the other tit mice out of the way and all those species will be wrestling for the feeder because they'll be coming into some other bird's territory to do it and so that's just part of the excitement for this, this time of year part of what goes on every single year at nesting season and uh, larger birds by the way are already well underway they're in their nest or, or some of the young about to hatch, especially the owls and the larger birds, they have to get a head start. So they're, they're ahead of the game, but they don't come to your feeders generally. So we'll talk mostly about just the little songbirds. And uh, birdhouses, since it's that time, you should have your birdhouse prepped and ready to go by now. You may even have some birds going in and out. So we'll talk a little bit more about what makes a great birdhouse and, and uh, locations and uh, hole sizes, which is always an interesting topic. Absolutely. A lot of things to get to today. And um, we also want to just remind everybody watching that Richard Cole is here every first Wednesday of the month at three o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And he's here to answer your questions. You have quite an expert here. So please ask your questions and your comments. And Richard, let's start with the pine siskins, the bird that put you in business <laughs> or helped well, to two, keep you in business, right? Two, keeping us in business this year from fall of 20 into the spring of 21 is, uh, according to the Audubon Society, probably one of the greatest uh, southward migration, we call it a migration, but an influx uh, of pine siskins from the north. They typically live in southern Canada. That's all across southern Canada from east coast to west coast. But some years they tend to move out of there in the wintertime and move down into the south and southeast and eastern United States and in varying numbers. Uh, for many years it'd be like every three or four years maybe we'd see a handful of Siskins or, or a few more. Uh, here lately, uh, especially this year, a lot of people have hordes, I literally hordes of pine Siskins. Uh, there were times a few weeks ago I would see 100, 150, maybe 200 siskins out in the yard, all jockeying for position at a feeder and eating a lot of seed, which was good for business. But they're moving out now. They're, they're heading back along with a lot of other birds in this transitional state. They've got to get back north for their breeding territories. And the birds that have been out of the south uh, are moving back in here and up into the northern states for their breeding season. Uh, so it is a, it's a period of change, and it's very interesting to watch. It's kind of nice to have. It's almost like seasons. You know, you don't get the same thing all year long. It changes, and it's interesting to watch them come and go. I know, and you have actually been so up close and personal with them. You fed a pine siskin from your hand. Tell us about that. Well, you know, it's, we, we've done this with other birds. So you have to be very patient. Hummingbirds, we can feed out a feeder being held in our hands if you're very patient. Pine systems, you don't have to be quite as patient. Uh, when they're in here in, in mass and you put a feeder out there, they're used to coming to a feeder, you can stand two or three feet away with them, feed your hand. And once maybe getting a little crowded at the feeder, it'll just hop over in your hand. I've had three or four or five in my hand before just eating away. And they just look at you, and as long as you don't make a quick, sudden movement, they're fine with that. Uh, one of the few birds that will readily just take to your hand when you, when you go to hand feed or if you approach them slowly and, and cautiously and don't uh, try to scare them, uh, they'll jump in your hand easily. 
That is just absolutely amazing. I love that you got a picture and everything and it just sat there in your hand. That is just something. I mean, that's what I aspire to, Richard. <laughs> that, but like you said, you've got to have a lot of patience. So tell us yeah. about how you can look at a pine siskin and tell it from a goldfinch because they can look a little bit alike. They can. Uh, a siskin is smaller than a goldfinch. Uh, they're really a dinky little bird. Uh, I think they're, they're rated at like maybe a three and three quarter inch bird and, a, and a, a, a goldfinch is like a four and a half inch bird, something like that. So they're, they're, they're all small, uh, but it's, it tends to be darker. It doesn't have any light underneath hardly. And uh, they're just a little striped bird. It's easy to confuse those with house finches also because of the striped breast, but they're just much, much smaller. Beak is very tiny, and it has a little orange uh, on its wing or in, near the tail, especially the males. Hard to tell male and female sometimes. Uh, if you get very used to them, you can start spotting them uh, easily, but if you're not familiar with that bird that much, they all look about the same, and that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> they can look so much closer than what yeah. I thought. So tell us yeah. a little bit about the National Audubon Society and the winter erup. What do you call eruption. it? <laughs> eruption. An of eruption. Siskins. Yeah, it's almost like a volcanic eruption. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the things that they they they've been studying these birds for a long time because it's all of a sudden if you're in the eastern United States you just get all these birds. It's like early winter maybe, and all of a sudden a lot of birds show up that you don't usually see. As I said, some four, five, six, seven years ago, uh, I would went through years where we saw pine siskins maybe every other year. You might see one or two maybe every year for a while, but not the hordes that we see now. And I'm sure everybody don't have hordes of pine siskins in the east, but a lot of people do. And they're, when they're moving through, everybody gets probably to see a bunch of them at a time. Maybe 20 or 30 or 40 is not unusual at feeders as they move in and out. Uh, and it's really fun when they all come in and they're at your yard and you've got hundreds. It's just interesting to watch. It's costly for bird seed, but it's interesting to watch. It is. And, you know, they're a little um, aggressive with each other. I Just because yes. there's so many of them. They're always yes. pushing each other out of the way. Yes. And that's one of the reasons it's easy to get them in your hand. Because they're really? hungry and there's a lot of them. There are a bunch of them waiting out in the trees to get to the feeder. And if they see another food source and nobody's there, they'll hop right in the hand and start eating. I'm going to have to try that. I may have missed it for this year, but I will try that. So tell us about the spring migration that's going on now, Richard. Well, it's, like I said, it's, it's that time of year, and the birds that typically uh, survive on insects for the most part of their diet, the warblers and all, they had moved down to Central and South America, and uh, at least or far south in the United States along the Gulf Coast. Those guys are coming back. A lot of the other birds are, are now coming back into the territory. They'll be moving to Georgia where we are, and some will be moving on up to the, uh, all the way up to Maine and, and southern Canada, uh, depending on which bird. And uh, you'll start to see these birds that you haven't seen in a while, like some of the warblers, which are hard to recognize uh, for the most part to a lot of people because we don't see them all the time. And there, a lot of people call them just little brown jobs. Maybe some of them have yellow, some of them have some orange. Uh, and they don't come to feeders that much. Some of them do, but most of the warblers are, stay away from feeders, eat mostly insects out in the wild. So it's just nice to see those guys come back in. And uh, of course, we, we do lose some birds. Some of the birds that will be down here, Siskin is a great example. Uh, they're not every year, but they'll move back north. And uh, in some cases, a lot of the goldfinches you'll see uh, come in more back in here. They uh, will move. Uh, they were down here for the winter time. They'll move further north, so you might have fewer goldfinches around, but they'll still be in your area for breeding. Yeah, it's such a great time. Is there any particular bird that you like to watch them migrate or watch for the migration? You know, there is, and uh, it's one we. <laughs> I'd love to be able to get it come to a feeder, but uh, sandhill cranes. Oh uh, yeah, we're, we're fortunate in in the, in the in the Atlanta area that we're directly under a flyway, a major flyway for the eastern portion of Canada's Sandhill crane population. And every year, it's almost like it's a harbinger of fall to come or winter to come and a harbinger of spring that's about here. Uh, the Sandhill cranes headed south in, in the fall time and 
I think it was two or three weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, uh, I heard uh, over a two or three day period, three, four, five, six different flocks uh, coming overhead. And they're so far up, it's hard to see them sometimes, but you can certainly hear them. That's what I said. Yes. Very loud. Yes. Yeah. You will hear them before you see them. Yeah. Absolutely. And, they and are sometimes beautiful. I never see them. I just hear them. I know they're up there somewhere. And uh, they're so far up and so small, it's difficult to see them, but you can still hear those birds. Yeah. Big mouth. Yeah, that that is an amazing migration. Um, and so let's talk about the breeding season and that is coming up and that's a really fun time to get to be able to watch the birds in their mating and that sort of thing. And we're looking at a picture of two bluebirds at a nesting box. This is actually oh, yeah. our March calendar picture which shows like mom and dad at the nesting box and boy do they get busy during the spring. They're already busy here and probably a little further north that they're just starting this process uh, of going in and out of boxes, looking at the territory. If they've used the box last year, they'll come back and check it out. Uh, therefore, uh, we'll talk about cleaning again one more time. If you haven't already, make sure you've got that box cleaned out and ready to go for this year. And uh, be very careful not to start throwing out a nest they just built. Uh, but throw out an old nest, make sure there's no parasites in there, clean the box close it back up, get it ready for them. But you will get to watch this. You'll get to watch them build a nest. You'll see them coming, going, spending a lot of time around the nest. And if you're careful, you can monitor nest boxes while the birds are in there. Just make sure you shoo out the female and don't run up and startle them real quick. Just tap on the box lightly to see if they'll fly out. Open it very slowly to see if there's one in there. If there's, of course, a female in there, possibly sitting on it, you just close it back slowly and walk away. But uh, you won't really hurt the birds to check them every now and then. The ones that we put out a box for, a nest box, are ones we we get to partake, partake more of that process. It's nice, you get you got the robins out in the trees, they're building nests. A lot of the other birds just build nests in different places in bushes and trees. And it's like, yeah, there they are, they're they're mating, they're having young, but it's not as close and personal and observable as when you put the birdhouse out in the yard and you have birds coming in and out of it. It's like some housing you provided for them. And let me talk about the word birdhouse. Really a much better term is nesting box because birds don't live in birdhouses. They simply use them as a place to hide their eggs and incubate, hatch, and raise their young to get them out of the box to go out into the world. But they don't really live there. That being said, on cold winter nights, sometimes, especially like bluebirds and some of these strong cavity nesters, we'll go back in there and pile up on each other to stay warm. But they typically don't live in the boxes. And I, I've got a box here. There's a lot of different birdhouses, nesting boxes out there, but there's several features that make them really better for the birds. Uh, first of all, material. Wood and Cedar is a good material, it's lightweight, it is pretty much impervious to the weather, and it has good insulating abilities with a really hot sun, doesn't penetrate so badly, yet the box stays nice and warm, and that's what these guys like. Uh, most of these birds' body temperature is about 104 degrees normally, so they can take the heat, and they need the heat when they're raising their young. That brings in another question. Do you want the box to get too hot? No, so you ventilate it. And if you'll look at the bottom of a lot of boxes, you'll see the corners nipped out. So not much falls through there, but it allows air to come in from the bottom. Also, air can come into the ventilation, to the entry hole, and it can go out. Some houses will have vents here on the side or up under the roof. So the hot air can move through and out. And that's, that's a good way to have it. The size of a nest box is important. Uh, it's recommended for, say, bluebirds, uh, four inch by four inch inside square, about six to 10 inches deep down from the hole. Eight inches is probably normal. And that gives the bird plenty of room to hop in, get down, build a nest, and also plenty of room for them to be down low enough so when a raccoon or another predator comes in and reaches their hand in, they can't reach the birds. And that's important. So a box is too short, puts them too close to the top. Another reason for cleaning after nest box each year so they don't come in and build a nest on top of the old nest, put them and their young and their eggs close to the hole. Uh, 
you might not be able to see it, but this has a metal ring in here, copper ring. That's just to stop squirrels from chewing the hole out bigger. Nice thing. Some people sell the little square wooden block that bolts over the hole to give them protection from somebody reaching in and down to grab something. The best protection for your birds is to have your nest box mounted on a pole about five feet high in an open area for bluebirds. And uh, best would put a squirrel baffle on the pole so they can't climb up and get into it, squirrels or raccoons. Uh, Tough Bird Feeder Guard, one of the products we came up with is a little electric device, electronic device that fits on poles and stops uh, snakes and raccoons from climbing up to get to the box. And it'll give them a little mild electric shock to stop them. But a good squirrel baffle or something all under the box on a pole is a great way to mount these things. And uh, there are other materials you can see. And you'll see I've got uh, two boxes in the yard that are actually made out of a concrete formulation. They're basically cement. Uh, really heavy, but they're nice, and they do the same thing as the wooden box. They insulate and protect. So make sure you have a good nest box out there and uh, mount it properly, and you'll have a good season. Yeah, I know. They're, the bluebirds are so much fun to watch. Do you want to quickly go over, like, what you can put out to, if you're going to put out the nesting boxes to attract the bluebirds, what kind of food should you put out for the bluebirds to get them to come? Bluebirds typically aren't seed eaters. And uh, traditionally, there's not much you could feed them other than maybe some white berries and stuff. But they have grown quite accustomed in the last 20 years to sunflower meats. There's no shell on them. They're like little insect pieces or fruit pieces. And these uh, the bluebirds love sunflower meat. So I'd always suggest put out a little dish or a bowl or in a platform feeder, sunflower meats. I have bluebirds coming to a regular tube feeder now and we're seeing a lot more of this, they're learning. But uh, nut berry suet blend gives them a, a mix of some fruits and some suets in two different flavor uh, form. And also uh, freeze dried mealworms, it's a, it's a great choice. They'll take those and uh, because it gives them all the nutrition of a live mealworm, but they're dry and you don't have to worry about trying to keep them alive before you feed them. So put those out in a bowl, the Bountiful Bowl from Coles is a great thing you can put you can put the mealworms in there. You can put some of the nut berry suet blend. You can put some of the suet kibbles, which is the smaller pieces of suet. And the bluebirds love all of those things, and so do most of the other birds. Okay, Great feeding choices. Richard, we do have a question. Stacy oh. Kunzer Green asks, does it matter if the box is in sun or shade? What a great question. That is a good question. I should have mentioned that. Um, it does matter. How much, I don't really know. It's recommended that, especially for bluebirds, that they be out in an open sun location, not in the woods or not in the backyard under the shade trees. And that's a, a good place for them to be because that's where the bluebirds want to be. They'll sit on the top of the nest box and patrol or scout their territory for insects. They'll fly down and hit them on the ground and come back to the nest box. So it provides two things for them, a perch to find food and a secure nesting place. And like I said, if it's on a pole with a guard on it, they're going to be pretty safe from predators too. So that that is a great, I'm so glad that Stacy asked that question and we do want to invite you to ask all of your birding questions while you have Richard Cole here as an expert. Um, I have a question. Uh, let, let, me, let me mention okay. something for Stacy. Okay. Also, if you don't have a, a great sunny pasture to put your box out in, put it wherever you can get a little bit of sun. Uh, heavy shade probably won't be as effective. But I would never say that a bluebird is not going to take a, a, a nice nest box in almost full shade. I've seen that happen. So have several boxes and put them in different areas. That's the best way to assure you'll get chickadees, titmice, uh, perhaps a nuthatch, and bluebirds. Just give them some choice. So Stacy says thank you, Richard. Um, also, talk about how far you might want your nesting box from your feeders, especially if you want to attract bluebirds and how far they might be from, I don't know, should you have them near trees or out away from trees? I see them out a lot of times just completely with no really trees around, maybe 10 feet away, but you know, out in an open field. Well, for bluebirds, eastern bluebirds uh, and all the bluebird populations, yes, very, very wide open spaces 
are great. That's where these guys want to be and feed. They'll be at a tree line, and they'll use tall things out in open fields, fence lines off to sit and perch and look for food, like I was saying. Uh, so put your box. Uh, I like bluebird boxes mounted about five foot high, not much lower than that, because I do like to put a baffle on to stop predation from raccoons especially and for snakes. Uh, but if you don't have that wide open thing, put it where you can get some sun, the morning sun especially. Uh, and they don't mind it getting hot, but they like to have it in a sunny location. I've heard a lot about whether it faces north or east or south or west. I haven't seen in practical applications that it mattered too much. There was some of that is, is about, well, the prevailing winds are from this direction and it might take the rain in the hole, but I don't know if it matters too much. Put it where you can put it. The biggest thing is use more than one. It's like you going shopping for a new house and you see the one on the corner, everybody else really, oh, that's a great house. It might not appeal to you. You might want one at the end of a cul-de-sac. So the birds are somewhat the same way. I, long time ago, quit trying to second guess them on where, where they wanted to nest because I, uh, I'll tell the story often that I had my box in a perfect place in the front yard and a neighbor two or three doors down had theirs in the backyard in the shade and that's where the bluebirds went. So you just don't know. But yeah, open sunny location is great. If you're looking for chickadees and tit mice, same kind of thing, they'll go there. Uh, at, the wood, at the wood line, it's a good place too, where they get part sun and they're not too far from the trees. So, so another thing that my husband did to try to attract them is to take like a branch because that's how they, they eat. Like he just stuck a, a dead tree branch into the yard nearby so that they could sit there, scout, you know, for, for bugs and go down to the ground when needed. And they really use those. It was funny, my neighbor, our neighbors said like, why is Ron doing that? Putting out, you know, <laughs> dead tree, like that's not gonna grow. But the bluebirds knew exactly what it was for. Yes, yes. And you could do something like that real close to your nesting box. Of, well, not so close that a squirrel can hop on it and hop right over to the top of your box if you have a baffle on the pole. You don't want any predator to be able to get there. But if it's five or 10 feet away, it's a perching place for them. They love that. They like to stage and watch before they go in and out of the nest at feeding time. Richard, I would have never thought about, I always think about whether or not the snake, a snake could get into uh, the box. And I know that's so important. We have some vines outside. We have to always cut them back, make sure that we're not giving a snake an opportunity to go <laughs> up that pole, right? But I never right. thought about an animal reaching their arm in there and yep. grabbing something. So they probably want to get the eggs, right? Or Absolutely. Yeah. Raccoons yeah. Uh, can do that. And sometimes uh, if I'm talking to people about they've had a problem with a nest, I can ask them a few questions to find, pretty much tell them what got in the thing. If, if you open your nest box and the nest is destroyed and parts should be pulled out the hole, you're looking at a raccoon nine out of 10 times. That's what got to it. Uh, if the t nest is totally understoried, the eggs are just missing and everything looks perfect other than that, probably a snake went in and took the eggs. So two ways you can tell that. And snakes can climb poles, they can climb pipes, and certainly climb wooden things and trees. So uh, yeah, get, put them on a pole, put a baffle on that pole, uh, like a good squirrel baffle or a good raccoon baffle or a tough bird feeder guard to stop the snakes and raccoons from getting up there to the birds. And uh, you'll have a lot better chance. You might not have a problem with predation, but it, what you do, it, it's kind of, you don't like that. It's not a good feeling when you see that. And, but if that does happen, just make sure you protect them the next season or later for that season, they may come back, start over. Yeah, it's always fun to watch them. And one thing I would encourage everyone to do is have patience. When you put those nesting boxes out there, it can take a while, but once the bluebirds do discover them, they will come back again and again and again. And I guess it's maybe their babies coming back or whatever, <laughs> but it does Hard take to patience to get them started. So tell us about some of the other things to watch and to listen for during this mating season. Well, certainly uh, the behavior differences, I think is one of the easiest ones to point out. And you'll notice is male cardinals will start to feed the females. You'll see a female there and you'll see a male cardinal come up and reach over like they're gonna kiss and he's, he's giving a little a seed or, or a sunflower meat or a little food or an insect it found. And that's part of that courtship ritual. Other birds have much more sophisticated courtship rituals. You see some of them on television with some of the bower birds and things like that. Uh, even our uh, 
uh, common flicker, which is a woodpecker, uh, does some of that type of thing where they'll stand and look at each other and they'll bill wipe. You see some shorebirds do that where they, they sit there and almost like their sword play with their beaks and then they'll freeze their motion and it's like, then they go back to it and they freeze their motion. You don't see it. I've only seen it like twice. Uh, but when you do witness it, it's really interesting. All those birds have little courtship rituals and you'll see them dancing around or hopping around on the floor. And you'll have all these calling. If it's just a pair, you'll see the male trying to impress the female with its wonderful vocalizations. And you'll hear those all around your house, especially this time of year. They've changed what they're doing. They're now announcing their territory and looking for females. Now is also when you'll hear a lot of woodpeckers. They don't call like that. They just pound on things that make a lot of noise, kind of like a drum. So they hit your gutters and uh, your chimneys to make a loud, resonant sound to attract the females and to tell the other males that this is my territory. So. Yeah, this is certainly a great time of year. We're almost out of time. We don't have any more questions. Uh -oh. uh, we do invite you to ask your questions. And uh, Richard, anything else that you want to say at this point? I don't know. Did we cover pretty much everything? Uh, I think we did. The, the biggest thing, and I, I emphasize this, make sure your birdhouse is ready to go for the season and uh, get it properly outfitted so you can stop any predators if you had problems with those. And uh, make sure you have feed out for these birds. It's going to be a real hard time for these guys to feed everybody. All of a sudden, they're going to have a family of five to feed. And uh, so make sure your feeders are clean and you have some extra food out for them and keep it out there uh, on a consistent basis. Uh, so that they'll have it during the next, oh, well, in some cases, uh, three, four, five, six weeks for a lot of birds and it's over with. Some birds like the bluebird, they will nest two, three, and sometimes four times in a season and uh, trying to raise as many young as possible. So you'll have those guys coming for food like the suet and the mealworms. So yeah. put a little food out for all the guys that are going to need it during the nesting and raising of young season. Okay, Richard, we have one more question. So George okay. Franco asks, do colored homes like the Sea Rock City birdhouses with three entry holes work? A friend gave me one and we placed it on a tree. Uh, three holes? Yeah, I wonder if oh. it's just decorative. Yeah, it is. Uh, really, it's probably styled be, to be a, a sort of a purple Martin house that you see the ones that are generally made out of metal or tin and they're up there where they got holes all the way around them, little porches and things. For purple martins, are, are, they all nest together or like to be close together. You'll see people with gourds hanging out on a big pole out in the country. That's for purple martin. So that house is really decorative. Uh, it's probably not going to attract, uh, it might get a bluebird. You can't say that it won't, but it probably won't get much. And if it's on a tree, it's probably going to get destroyed by a squirrel. Uh, look, looking to try to find out whatever's inside. If it's not metal, it's going to chew that wood apart. Uh, you can mount, I've seen some of these mounted on posts in a yard. They look kind of nice and uh, you may get something in it. Uh, certainly don't throw it away, just, but I would, I would suggest mounting it on a post somewhere uh, so that it's got a better chance of the squirrels not getting right onto it to tear it up. And you may get somebody nesting in it. <laughs> well, is it bad if it's got three holes and they decided to nest in it? Would it be bad that they might uh, get a predator, might attract a predator or no? no I, I, I'm no different than any other yeah. uh, a box. If it's got three or four holes in it, 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 it they'll pick one. There's probably chambers inside. They'll pick a chamber. The oh, biggest thing okay. is that if you do need to protect the, that box from things getting to it because they're, they don't have depth there in those holes. Maybe it, it goes down an inch, so they have to build their, their nest back up into it, and something can reach right in if they get up there, and it's too easy to reach the birds. And a lot of birds probably wouldn't take it, but some may. You may get sparrows in there, and you never really know. You may get a bluebird in one of those. Yeah. All right, Richard, thank you so much. And once again, we are here every first Wednesday of the month at 3 o'clock with Richard Cole, the wild bird expert. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. I bet you'll be out there watching birds. In just a few minutes, I will. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Richard. We'll see you next month. Thank you.
Hello, this is Richard Cole. I want to thank each of you for watching, and I want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and don't forget to share it.